Shall we be standing? You are holy. Hymn number 82. I welcome all of you who have joined together this morning to worship great love. A couple of announcements, a reminder that today at 3 p.m., the Sweet Harps of Reno, Nevada will be performing their harp concert here in the sanctuary. All are welcome to attend that event. Also, we have our names for the giving tree, the angel tree, for the 50 gifts that we purchase for those students from Elmcrest School who might not have a Christmas without our assistance. The names are available. Uh, Jonna Hansmeyer has them, and you can see her following worship um, and get your name or names. All of those gifts purchased for the Elmcrest Elementary School um, students will need to be back here at the church by December 6th. So if you want to catch some of those deals, whether this weekend or Black Friday weekend, grab your name today before you leave. That is it for our announcements, so please take a few moments to greet one another. And so we shall be known Christians by our love. Let us be standing, if so able, as we share in our call to worship. Into the birthing of change, the birthing of an idea, a new lifestyle, a new honesty, a new way of meaning in our life. An infant, into all this change comes the sharpening of our sense of expectation and hope. Let us approach God in full assurance and hope knowing that we are not alone in change. Our hymn of affirmation, hymn number 407, How Firm a Foundation.
and a share together in our prayer of invocation. Creator God, as the birth pangs of change intensity in the midst of a broken world, sustain our wisdom and fortify our hope of wholeness. As new realities push toward birth, increase our curiosity and our awareness of life's wanting to be in fullness and healthy creation. Amen. May be seated. As we turn to God's Word this morning, we are sharing our first reading from the Old Testament canon, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 to 20, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. On the day when Elkina sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Phania, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Hannah used to provoke, be provoked by her. And therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. And then I will set him before you as a Nazarite into the day of his death. He shall not drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall ever touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all of this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. And then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and she bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord Elohim. Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies 
because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him his actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with the spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be caught off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord! His adversary shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Our second reading is from the primary gospel of Mark in chapter 13. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus answered him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew Ask him privately, tell us when this will be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. I see trees of green, red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people going by i see friends shaking hands saying how do you do they're really saying i love you i hear babies cry i watch them grow They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, 
What a wonderful world. Thank you so much, Tim, for blessing us this morning with that beautiful song and your beautiful voice. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this morning. Amen. We continue our dance through the Hebrew scriptures from Naomi and Ruth. Today we meet Hannah and Elkanon and Eli, a woman lost in despair, a man intent on life as usual, and rather clueless to boot, and a judgmental prophet. Hannah's story is a familiar biblical one of a barren woman longing for a child in the ongoing saga of human desires. Hannah, although loved by her husband, Elkanon, was lost in despair due to her barrenness, which was a social and cultural stigma that caused Hannah great embarrassment, grief, and a rocky future at best. Should she become a widow, her station in her society would be perilous. As ancient social status worked, she would have no one to care for her, much like the situation Naomi and Ruth found themselves in. Well, in her despair, she implores God to remember her, to hear her prayers and allow her to conceive. And in her darkest hour, she came to the house of God in Shiloh and poured her soul out to God. She defined herself as a woman deeply troubled as prophet Eli reproaches her for her extreme behavior. She answers, I've been speaking to God out of my great anxiety and vexation. She cried out in her misery, remember me. She directs her grief and lament in prayer to the God of wombs and women, to the God of the world. In a world where barrenness was considered a curse, only the birth of a child could complete Hannah. So day after day, year after year, she had to live with a pain in her heart that would not go away. Her barrenness was an unsettled ache. An unsettled ache lingers no matter what one does. Possibility thinking, positive psychology, words of affirmation, wishing, hoping, even praying, don't make the hurt go away. It is an unwelcome guest that wore out its welcome a long, long time ago. Unlike hurts that are at least manageable, this type of hurt affects one's entire life, leaving hearts wounded and spirits broken. And this type of wound splinters our being into a million little pieces. I have been blessed with the opportunity to travel to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, twice, to work with Re-Member, an outreach project to the Oglala Lakota Nation. Re-Member works to relieve the conditions on the Pine Ridge Reservation that represent a part of our world that is beyond broken. Their name, re-member, 
means to put back that which is broken, to remember. In a similar way, Hannah is remembering herself. As she cries out to God, trying to put back the pieces of herself that are broken and splintered. Hannah instinctively knew that in our greatest discouragement, despair, and disappointment is the place of God's beginning. It's not figuring out the right spiritual discipline or the latest strategic plan that meets our needs. It is in simply and straightforwardly expressing our need to God. In doing so, Hannah discovers that wholeness in life lays beyond those things that we can and cannot control and rests in divine love as the largest reality in life, even during the darkest times. Reverend Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite authors, uses the darkness of night as a metaphor for the darkest moments of life. In her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, and she describes one of those moments. A friend of mine says he turns over and over in bed when he wakes in the middle of the night in fear, that kind of unexplainable fear that freezes our soul, until he has all of the bedding wrapped around him like a bandage. One night, his wife tried to get some of the covers, yanking at them and yelling at him to go back to sleep. I can't, he whispered. I think it's God bothering me. Well, God's not bothering me, she said, so get up and pray already, but do it somewhere else. It is easy for us to slip into the mire of hopelessness, wrapping ourselves up in bandages of despair as we watch the endless loop of tragic cable news. But this is a story, a story of God's love coming to Hannah at the darkest moment of her life, breaking through her despair to show her even there is God. Taylor states, I've learned that it's the things in the darkest moments that I could never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over again. So there is really only one logical conclusion. We need darkness as much as we need light. Hannah's story is the story of a love that will not let us go. A love that can transform the future and bring hope amid despair and pain. God remembered Hannah. And God remembers us. In our misery and in our darkest moments, God remembers. Hannah discovered that God is neither remote nor Reluctant. God is not disinterested to the point that we need to beg or plead for God's loving concern. What is needed is not a relentless beating on the door of God's consciousness, but for us to rest in the knowledge that God, who is being itself, is. And a story reminds us that prayer can quiet and comfort even the most troubled heart. She came to the house of God and poured out her heart. And following her prayers, Eli says to her, go in peace. And she is no longer downcast. As the text states, her countenance was sad no longer. She released her misery to God and she found peace. It is in the offering of prayer, not 
the answer of prayer that brings peace. Peace is not the result of God answering all of our prayers as the great ATM in the sky. Peace comes through the act of turning to that which is being itself, the life-affirming force that is love. Hannah didn't know if she would get an answer to her pleas. She didn't know the outcome. But she did know. God remembered her. After Hannah has ritually offered a sacrifice and promised to lend her God, her child to God, she returns full. And she eats for the first time. Now there is still a patriarchal socioeconomic structure to which she's been forced to yield. But we have to be careful not to impose too much of our own understanding of the way the world works on the world during the writing of this story. The Bible, even the messy parts, still might teach us. And what do we learn today? That often while we are looking for something large and bright, and unmistakably holy, something small and dark and apparently insignificant is slipped into our pockets that poke our memories to recall that new life starts in the dark. Whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb, new life starts in the dark. Pain passes, beauty remains. Darkness and despair are temporary, but divine love is eternal and universal and always life-affirming. Where did Hannah discover God? In the midst of her despair. She came in, in all her broken honesty, and she met the love that knows no bounds. We, too, need not clean ourselves up to come to God. God comes to us in the dark places that we wander and remembers us in all the broken places in our lives. Great love is there. Amen. Let us come before God in an attitude of prayer. And as we do, I ask that we remember those from this gathering who are in need of our prayers for healing and for wholeness. And so I lift up the Morton family as they end their time of dealing with quarantine following Claire and Owen contracting COVID. I also lift up Isabel Stark, who has been hospitalized and in rehab for the last couple of weeks. And let us remember Patty Perry, 
who is dealing with her own illness and continues to undergo treatment in regards to that. Let us pray. Great love, we often forget that no matter what you, you are with us. You are with us in those dark times of despair, in those times where we feel lost and without an anchor in life. Remind us that no matter where or who we are, that you are present. Remind us that no matter what, you remember us. Oh, great love, we lift up those from this gathering who are in need of your healing wholeness and strength. We lift up the families who have children who are fighting either illness or other issues. Be with those families and strengthen them during these difficult and dark times. Oh God, we lift up to you today our own personal, private joys and concerns. Hear them now as we lift them to you in silence. We lift all of these prayers to you in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now return a portion of our blessings, as well as our pledges and commitments and promises for 2022. 
Praise God from whom all blessings Let us share under our prayer of dedication. Receive our gifts with those of our sisters and brothers around the world, that all nations, languages, and peoples may unite. Alert us all to everyday evidence of your presence, writing your covenant on our minds and hearts, and empowering us to keep the promises we have made. Amen. Our closing hymn, hymn number 611, O Day of God, Draw Near. Now may God's face shine upon you, granting you peace until we gather again. Amen. <laughs>